let's let Don take the table. Wonderful. Uh, quick question, Zach. Is that a black bar on the right hand side visible to everyone? No, nope, that's just you. Okay, great. Because that's kind of in the way. <laughs> All right, everyone. Good afternoon. It's Don Fluharty here. Hey, I want to take this opportunity since some of us are somewhat trapped in our homes. Uh, to kind of give you an update on what's been going on with the invasive shot hole borer and the gold spotted oak borer. So the irony of the whole situation is, is when we first started thinking about doing this update, we were going to be out collecting data uh, the first week of March and uh, being able to give you what's going on directly up to the minute. But unfortunately, they closed access to the research sites, so we don't have the up to the minute <laughs> research information to present at this time. Uh, but hopefully, when they let us back into some of those areas, uh, we'll be able to get that to, out this spring. So I'm first going to start with uh, the gold spotted oak borer. And the reason why I'm recapping on this one in particular is because we've seen a high number of instances of it reoccurring uh, in the last year and especially in the last three months. So as you guys know, we had kind of a mild February to say the least. And so we've seen this pest actually starting to fly early. Um, so we wanted to get this out here so people were able to identify, know what they were looking for, see where it spread to, um, so this doesn't accidentally uh, fall under the radar with all the other chaos that's currently going on in our lives. So the reason why we, we do focus on this one is because it is an invasive pest. I know it just came over from Arizona. We don't necessarily call Arizona invasive, <laughs> but um, Arizona actually shares a lot of pests with us. They're like the number one offender for sending invasive pests our way. Uh, so we always note when it came from Arizona. But with this uh, particular pest, um, it, it does a lot of damage to the actual trunk of the tree between the xylem and the phloem. And so it disrupts the water flow. And so we can see an entire tree die uh, fairly rapidly. We used to think that it would take a number of years before there'd be enough damage, especially on some of our older coast live oaks because they were gnarly bark, old, thick, but unfortunately, uh, since they feed on the canopy as well, uh, we've seen them actually start to deteriorate the overall health of these trees quicker. And we've seen trees uh, die within six months of the first observed initial attack. Um, so kind of keep that in mind. That's why we're going over this today. And any questions you have, don't hesitate to type them into Zach and I'll be happy to answer them at the end. But also know that we're looking for this pest, not just on the coast live oak, but on the canyon oak and the black oak. And there are a couple other oaks that we are feeling are susceptible as well. So just be aware of that. If you see that telltale D-shaped exit hole, um, that's your number one indicator to do further research. And it, it's just because it's one of the few pests that we have attacking our oak trees that create that very significant D-shaped exit hole. And as you can see in the photo there, there, there's some that still look almost round. But when you really look at them, and sometimes it helps if you carve away some of the uh, bark on the outside, you can very clearly see that D shape, that flat shape from that flat-headed borer. So inherent to its name, it's got six gold spots on its back. Um, I have never seen one of these pests out in the wild. I've never seen one on the bark of a tree. I've never seen one up in the canopy of the tree. I've only ever seen them on sticky traps. So don't expect to see the pest and identify it by the pest itself. Odds are you're going to be looking for the D-shaped exit holes um, or the larvae or the, the damage that they, they tend to do. But if, if you actually do identify one and you catch something, take a look. The adults are about a half inch long. Um, they do have that flat head bore to them. And usually we see the evidence of the attack on the bark because when they lay their eggs in the cracks and crevices um, and the the immatures start to bore in, we get kind of a weeping associated from that wet bark we have on our coast live oaks. And so sometimes that's kind of a telltale of initial site or location where a pest has gone in. Um, and then of course, once you kind of get the larvae under there, the woodpeckers tend to identify it and they start coming to, to have lunch. So you'll start seeing woodpecker holes as well on the trees. So there's a few things that can catch your attention. Odds are the first thing you're gonna notice is the canopy of the tree starting to decline, starting to thin, starting to look stressed. Uh, then you'll probably get up closer and that's when you'll start noticing these things like the D-shaped exit hole or the weeping spots on the bark um, or the woodpecker damage. So if you really kind of want to know what's going on, go ahead, pull that bark back. 
um, and you're going to see that there's galleries underneath that bark. And every now and again, if you really get lucky, you actually might find some of the larvae in those galleries. So um, that being said, feel free. You can actually take the samples. You can send them into the lab. They'll identify them. Uh, but pretty much this is our number one offender on our, our oaks, our coast live oaks and things. So if you find this, odds are you pretty much know who you're dealing with on it. And um, keep in mind that uh, just a couple of attack sites can produce a large number of larvae that can actually girdle that vascular tissue underneath that bark pretty quickly. And that's part of the reason why we see the stressor is the reduced canopy from the feeding from the adults. And then once we start losing the vascular tissue, uh, the trees can succumb pretty quickly. So right now, the spread has uh, kind of gone most north into the Angeles National Forest. Uh, that is definitely one of our current hot spots. Um, but they're convinced in, that it's going to be going into the kind of Ventura County area as well, falling over towards the Los Padres. And it's probably going to end up going up the coast into San Luis Obispo County uh, rather quickly. So the problem with this particular pest is that it's mainly moved by firewood. So as we come into our, our more late spring and summer months, uh, we tend to see this pest travel on the firewood as people go camping and get out into the forest. Problem is, is we don't notice any sort of spreader infestation until the following year when we start noticing uh, trees declining. So they kind of figure the pest has usually been there at least two years before we actually start identifying it and that's given the pest plenty of time to establish in the area and start a population, at which point it makes it much more difficult uh, to remove. And that's partly because we don't tend to find them in our urban canopy as much as we tend to find them um, in our kind of urban forest interface, where we're in uh, national forest, forest lands, right up against urban areas. That being said, that means there's usually lots of trees in one area, a lot of a food source, and it makes it more difficult for treatment. So as you can see, this kind of started out in San Diego County first, and it slowly but surely has been moving a little bit northwest and then north. Um, and like I said, their prediction is probably going to follow up the coast. Um, this pest does have the ability to go into our hotter climate, um, but we, we don't have a lot of open forest area going up through Kern uh, to move in that direction. So all that will travel the coast and then cut back across into uh, places like Madera and Tuolumne counties. So this is um, a very interesting outline of a, a schedule on the pest life cycle and treating uh, that was actually put out by the U.S. Forest Service. And the reason why I, I've got that up here for us to see is because you can see the adults mainly fly in April. That's kind of when we see the adults really feeding and flying. They want to go lay their eggs on the trees, usually in May. Um, and then, of course, then you have the, the larval feeding most of the rest of the time doing the damage. Um, that's why they have the orange bar showing the, the mechanical girdling. Whoop. No forward. Sorry. It's running away from me. Um, so what I want you guys to kind of notice on this one, and, and this is what brings the most concern, is uh, U.S. Forest Service has been recommending that we do contact insecticidal applications in May, because you know the adults are out and about, they're starting to want to lay their eggs, so they want us to get ahead of it and have us do it in May. The problem we run into is our coast live oaks flower pretty much from February to May. Our canyon oaks flower from April to May, and uh, our black oaks are April to May. So we have to be very careful what we're applying uh, due to the timing of the flowering of these trees, uh, as well as trying to get good control on these pests. Um, the only thing that, of course, I don't quite, why is it like, hmm, terribly sorry, hold on, we're getting back there again. The only thing I don't quite agree with 100% on is their systemic insecticide application timing. But there is a reason why they do it. They, they recommend that because a lot of these oaks are in rangelands. So there's not a watering system or water necessarily available to the trees until we get into our rainy season. So they're defining our rainy season as more of November, December, January, February. So in order to get the chemical moving systemically inside the trees, the application timing they say is best during November, December, January, February. If you have the ability to water the tree and get the chemical to move, then that does adjust the timing that uh, the injectables and systemic insecticides can be done. But I tend to do them all the way up until March, even early April. 
Um, and then uh, if we get an early rainy season, as soon as the rain starts, I tend to start out there getting applications done in October. So kind of keep that in mind. That's, that's kind of the schedule we're working with with this pest. And like I said, this year we are distinctly different, and that is because of our mild February. So whereas we normally don't see the adult and egg laying to April and May, uh, there's a really good chance that we're going to actually start seeing it sooner, probably more likely um, March and April. So keep that in mind when and doing any sort of uh, applications against this particular pest. So this was the uh, um, basically the field study that was put out by the Forest Service specifically on the gold spotted oak borer. I'm not sure if any of you guys have really taken the time to fully read through <laughs> uh, this, this particular document. But it, it was kind of interesting on how well they covered uh, basically the, the hosts, um, what, what we could do mechanically to deter the pest, uh, overall health conditions for oaks. I mean, they really did a very all-inclusive document. Um, what I pretty much pulled was the first page, page uh, 11 and 12, because they reviewed what insecticidal treatments we're actually doing against this pest. Because uh, that honestly is our first and foremost uh, action against the invasives. And so in this particular case, I went through and looked at all the different chemical recommendations that they were making, everything from um, carbamates to pyrethroids uh, to dinotefurons to imidacloprids to emamectin benzoates. And I kind of did a breakdown of the treatments and timings uh, that they're talking about in the system. Uh, but the one thing I kind of wanted to point out was that you can see I boxed them in red, the things that I thought were kind of key. And one was that when you're anywhere, they were doing any sort of trunk injection applications of imidacloprid and imidacloprid benzoate, um, they were applying them once every two years, uh, which I definitely agree with imidacloprid benzoate. I'm not sure, depending on your timing, if you can really get two years out of the imidacloprid. Uh, so that was a little disconcerting. Uh, the other thing that you can kind of see in here is they talked about the fact that we're, some of our are still in progress, and that's true. When we first started this research with them, uh, it was back in 2010, we were down in El Cajon, and unfortunately, after the first application, uh, we had pretty much um, greatly reduced uh, the pest population and pest pressure, uh, so that by when we came back for the second year, we really didn't have any significant results because we unfortunately didn't have any pest pressure at that point. Uh, so we found a new site. The new site is uh, kind of up in the mountains above Temecula. Tons of pest pressure, so we have enough trees. We don't think we'll crash the population before we get our two years of research out of that one. Uh, we just need them to open the boys' camp again so we can get back up there and start pulling some of the results. So uh, what I did here on the next document is I went through and I kind of reviewed all the different uh, chemicals that they had recommended. And honestly, the one that the Forest Service is mostly using at this point is actually the carbamates, the seven. So they're going out and they're spraying um, the trees. And when they do this, they're only going after the adults. It, it's more of a, a contact. It's stopping them from attacking. It does nothing for any sort of the larvae inside the tree. Um, and keep in mind, with this particular product, it doesn't last long on the tree. It breaks down quite quickly under sunlight. And so therefore, if our timing window moves at all, uh, we can completely miss this pest altogether. Uh, but the one that I know I've heard the most uh, concerns about is the fact that this particular product is highly toxic to bees, and since we're spraying it, uh, bees are an issue. And with these trees blooming during the application timing, uh, that's an even bigger issue. So we know bees are out foraging. So that being said, uh, Forest Service spends a lot of time putting down tarps, uh, and making sure they're trying to protect as best they can when doing these applications. Uh, but they choose to do it because of basically time and money. Um, it's fast. They can do a large number of trees at once uh, with giant spray equipment, and there's no issue of per acre limits. So that's the main reason why the Forest Service themselves have chosen to do that particular application. Uh, they have kind of stayed away, stayed away from the pyrethroids, the bifenthrins and things, uh, mainly because, again, it's really toxic to bees, um, but it's also toxic to fish, so you can't get anywhere any sort of watering. Um, some of them don't have the broad enough labeling uh, to actually be done. And then it also has that timeline of not uh, a long effective or long residual. So the way I've actually listed these up here is based on their residual timing. So seven being the shortest, uh, the pyrethroid being longer, 
uh, diastectron being even longer, and then midocloprid and MX and benzoate. But that being said, uh, with the treatments that they're talking about and doing studies on, uh, a lot of it was actually done in the lab. So a lot of these weren't actually applied to trees and studied that way out in the field. Uh, a lot of them were just uh, assays done in the lab to see if the, it would actually uh, eliminate the pest. So we do know that 7 and the, the carbamate and the pyrethroids will work for that, um, but short timelines and uh, definitely not the best options uh, for someone doing applications. Dinotepron has been used more uh, as of late as a, as a basal spray. Um, it is systemic, uh, but uh, keep in mind, it's also toxic to bees, so spraying it while the bees are out and foraging is a big issue during this time of year, uh, particularly with it. But the other reason why we're not seeing a whole lot of it being done is because of that per acre limit on our neonics. So if we're spraying it, we can only do, or soil drenching it, we can only do about eight 12 inch trees per acre. And when we're working in that wildland interface where we have hundreds of trees per acre, it's just not a viable option for that methodology for actually applying for this pest. Uh, the midocloprid, uh, the Imaget 10 uh, trunk injection methodology, they don't have that per acre limit since everything's going straight inside the tree, trapped inside the tree, not in the air, soil, or water. So therefore, uh, they can do as many trees as they need with the methodology. The thing is, though, it only lasts about a year in the tree. So it was a little concerning when I saw the printout saying, you know, possibly every other year. I understand they're doing that to eliminate labor, so you're not having to come back every year and retreat. Um, but my recommendation would be is if you're going to go for trunk injection, uh, you're much better off going with the m and benzoate that's going to last the two years in the tree and not actually have to come back. And again, there's no per acre limits on that label, uh, and we don't run into that issue of having the bee box on it, so therefore we can apply uh, during that time of year without that issue of flowering. So that was just kind of a quick review of the chemicals that were discussed in that particular uh, handout by the Forest Service, um, since that is what we have right now to base our uh, treatments off of. Um, hopefully in the near future, uh, we will have some information coming out of the most recent studies um, showing the effectiveness of uh, different products uh, against this particular pest. So there was a slight delay in that as well because uh, one of the head researchers along with Don Grossman was um, Dr. Steve Seibold, and unfortunately he passed away last year, but UC Davis is still on board and still working uh, to uh, send researchers out to collect the data and publish this information. So the one thing I wanted to address when treating for the gold spotted oak borer uh, is the injection process. And the reason why I wanted to go over this was because some people don't fully understand how we do the trunk injection. So it seems easier just to do a spray and, and come back every year and do the spray. Um, however, when we do this process, we're going to measure the tree and get the most accurate data on that tree in particular to know the exact dose we have to put in that tree. So that way we're not overdosing using excessive chemicals, we're using exactly what's needed for that one tree. And then we're just going to go ahead and drill in, we're going to pop in our one-way check valve, and then we're going to inject through that check valve. So that way we can get the exact amount of chemical we need inside the tree. So this is what it looks like once that chemical is inside the tree. So it's moving in the xylem tissue of the tree. It's not actually going in the heartwood of the tree, and it's not going out anywhere near that cambium layer. So we don't run into any of that uh, possible damage to the bark, any sort of cracking or splitting. If for some reason someone wants to set these plugs too shallow, we do run that risk. And that's why we're always talking about people when they're using this arbor plug, that it's incredibly important they set it directly below that cambium layer. So there's no risk of doing any sort of damage to it. That uh, plug is just gonna get sealed over by the tree with bark and put brand new that xylem tissue over the top of it. So that way we don't run into the issue because that was one of the things that I know uh, uh, Dr. Mary Louise Flint was very concerned about initially uh, was doing any sort of damage to that cambium layer. And so once we explained that when proper plug setting techniques are used and the plug is set deep enough below the cambium, there was no risk of that uh, damage to that cambium layer to happening. So the nice part is, is if you do run into a situation where there might be disease in the tree as well, if you notice the needle goes through that white rubber septum in the plug and out the back, but the needle never touches the tree. So we don't have to worry about vectoring disease specifically on that needle. So you do want to sterilize your drill bits though between trees, uh, just in case uh, if you're running into a diseased area or diseased wood. 
which is usually pretty identifiable because you'll notice that black or brown striations uh, in that tissue when you drill in. So the one thing I just want to drive home that whenever we're doing the trunk injections, we have to have that water in the xylem tissue. We've got to have the water to move the chemical. That's why we put the chemical in concentrate and at the base of the tree, it mixes the water. The tree does the work to distribute it for us. But if the tree doesn't have water, it's not going to be able to move it. So if you are working in a dry wildland situation, you are going to want to give the tree some water. Uh, you can give it a little water before. Sometimes that helps the applicator get it in a little easier because the tree is already uptaking and moving its vascular tissue. But then go ahead and water afterwards to make sure the tree has enough water to really circulate it throughout the entire canopy. Because that's the thing, is we're covering the bark with this, but also with trunk injection, we're covering the canopy as well. So as the adults feed on the canopy, they get the chemical. As the adults uh, or the larvae bore, they get the chemical. So we're treating for both the adult and the larvae as opposed to the spray applications where they're just going after the adult pests. So I always kind of sum it up with this one because usually we have to explain why we're doing tree injection. And the number one reason is because everything stays trapped inside the tree. It's not the air, it's not the soil, it's not the water. If you guys have heard me present before, you've heard me say this time and time again. And it is important, especially if we're working on wildland interfaces where we have streams and creeks uh, and, and things of that nature. So it also reduces the exposure to the public, which we don't run into too much in the wildland interface, but it does make a difference to the applicators out there doing the work. They're not having a Tyvek suit up because they're spraying chemicals all over. Um, so we haven't seen this pest too much in like downtown type public locations, but we are seeing some more in residential locations. So sometimes the public is around, which is perfectly fine to do this treatment in public locations. And like I said, when we're dealing with this and we inject the chemical directly inside that tree, the chemical lasts a lot longer. So like when we say we spray um, the carbamate on a tree, it lasts about seven days, really, and the sun starts breaking it down. Um, so when we try and get long residuals, it's much better to get the product exactly inside the tree where there's no sunlight hitting it and breaking it down, and there's no microbes in the soil feeding on it and breaking it down. So that's why we tend to go with the, the longer residuals whenever possible uh, to get into the tree. And then the other thing that uh, we always make a uh, time to point out is the fact that only the pest feeding on the tree gets the chemical. So that way we can still maintain our beneficial pest population. However, you will always see a change to your beneficial pest population. And I, I say this time and time again, it's an easy example to give on aphids because you have your, your lady beetles feeding on them and once you eliminate all the aphids, all of them leave because they no longer have a food source. So unfortunately, you do notice a difference in your beneficial pets, uh, but that's just because they're moving on to a location where there's more uh, food for them. And then of course, uh, this has the least amount of environmental impact. We use the least amount of chemical, and it gives us also the widest treatment window when going after this particular pest of the gold spotted oak borer. So if you guys have any questions of gold spotted oak borer, we'll go ahead and take them at the end. Um, I'm going to kind of pop into the invasive shuffle board to stay on time now and give an update on this pest as well. So I know you guys have heard plenty about this little pest, and if you guys were dealing with it at the very beginning, then you heard us call it the tea shot hole borer, and then you finally heard everyone refer to it as the polyphagus shot hole borer, and then it became the polyphagus shot hole borer, and then we got the crucio shot hole borer, and now we're back to a tea shot hole borer. So it's had a lot of different names, since, oh, 2008, I would say, when we first started trying to name them. Um, but that being said, we kind of now summed up the entire group with the invasive shot hole borer. Uh, so depending on where you are, might be which particular beetle you're working with. Um, but either way, only the females fly, the males don't, and they're significantly smaller. Um, we tend to find the females when they're backed up to a hole protecting it, protecting their brood. Uh, funny, the males, we just kind of find them aimlessly walking around on the tree. <laughs> But either way, uh, you can usually find the beetles in high infestation areas. And these photos are examples of high infestation areas. Uh, when we run into this particular pest and we see massive attacks, um, that is the key factor of this particular pest. That's how it survives. It does mass attacks and it reproduces quickly. Um, we've always said it's been about six weeks that it can reproduce and have a new brood. Um, it depends on the time of year and the season as to how many it's going to do. And what we're now learning is it seems to have 
almost dormant periods where it actually drops its population. Whether this is consciously done or not, we are not yet uh, have been able to show in any sort of research. However, it's interesting, this started back in uh, the Whittier Narrows. I think they got there close to 2010 uh, when it was really found there and infesting the area. And since then, it's, it's died out, treatments have been done, the pest has been pretty much under control. And all of a sudden last year, it started to flare up in the Whittier Narrows again. So it's almost like, I don't want to say it's Biden, it's time. Every time I feel like I give it too much credit, it actually comes back and proves that that's what it was doing. So um, we don't want to underestimate this particular pest. Every time we have, it's managed to thwart us. So what we've seen, we have really found with it, though, is the fact that since the pest itself doesn't feed on the tree, it just burrows through it, um, we have to have high rates of chemical in the vascular tissue in order for this pest to incidentally come in contact with it and die. However, we do know that treating for the fusarium that it brings in is effective in killing its food source, but it doesn't kill the pest. It just moves on and tries to grow a new food source someplace else. So it does nothing to really reduce the population, uh, but it does help give control on a tree-by-tree -tree basis. So keep that in mind when dealing particularly with this pest. You guys know all the trees it's attacking, but like I said, we've kind of noticed changes. We've noticed there's trees that it attacks and trees that it actually kills. So though we have actually it's now over, I think, 60-something um, host trees, uh, there's probably less than, I'd say, four or five varieties that it constantly kills. Whereas every now and again, we might get one that actually dies from it. Like for instance, um, Palo Verde. It doesn't normally kill Palo Verde, but I've seen Palo Verde trees die from it. So it's kind of one of those hit and miss um, infections and in how stressed the tree and the overall tree health is. So we'll kind of talk about that a bit. Uh, the other one, so anyway, sorry, that was Polyphagus shahol borer. Crucio shahol borer, just so you guys know the difference, is mainly a DNA difference and a geography difference. So this one showed up first in the San Diego County area, and it pretty much showed up on avocados. And that's how it even got this whole thing on our radar. And when they initially identified it, they called it the Polyphagus shahol borer in avocados. Once the DNA test come back and we found out we had a new beetle, we got a new name. So then we added the Crucio shahol borer. And this is the one that's moving. So the Crucio shahol borer is the one that seems to be transporting the nursery material faster than the Polyphagus shahol borer is moving. This is the one that moved up to San Luis Obispo County and up to uh, Santa Barbara County. And um, unfortunately, since it's not a class A invasive, we're not gonna get any sort of controls uh, on movement of this particular uh, pest. So we're not gonna see any sort of quarantines in place. So that puts the onus on us to really make sure we're identifying this pest, seeing where it is, seeing how it's moving and where it's moving. Um, and if you happen to be receiving any new plant material in, definitely look for this pest. You know, identify the mass attacks, any sort of small little uh, boring holes. And if you actually happen to see the beetle or any of the larvae, definitely get it tested. Um, I know you guys have all been a little bit concerned about the fact that um, the UC system's gone a little bit dark on this as of late, um, partly because uh, Keith Esquilon left uh, uh, the south and headed up to UC Davis up north. He is still working with the pest, um, so we still have him as a resource. And a matter of fact, he's still collaborating with us some some research we're doing um, at uh, the, the Rose Bowl. So that being said, more information and more research is coming. They haven't stopped on this particular pest. Um, it has just changed a little. So we'll have to see how they want to um, continue forward. Because when I was trying to pull an updated map, uh, the last time they'd updated the map was in uh, 2018. So we, we need to get some more resources behind that. But in the meantime, uh, we can kind of tell you what we've been seeing and how things have been changing. So as you guys know, with this one in particular, the damage is really done a lot by the disease. The pest does bore in, but it goes into the heartwood and it makes its galleries in the heartwood. Um, so if you pull back the bark, all you're going to see are these little tiny bore holes but you see the large amount of um, uh, fusarium infecting the tissue. And so that's what's causing the girdling effect a little bit quicker than necessarily uh, the pest itself in doing damage to the vascular tissue. Um, but I'm not gonna get into the argument between the entomologists and the pathologists of which one really kills the tree. It's a team effort. <laughs> 
Uh, and that's why when we work with this, we do do research both on the fusarium as well as the pest itself. So when we deal with sycamores, and this is still the number one tree that we're seeing most attacked, um, and we're actually seeing the highest mortality rate on sycamores. Um, however, it's kind of skewed when you look at the percentages. Because there's a higher number of trees being attacked, um, it looks like the death rate isn't terribly high on them. However, we see more sycamore trees dying than any other type of tree. So kind of keep that in mind when, when working with this in particular. But don't just look at the trunk. We'd always said stare at the trunk. You'll see these, you know, silver dollar size wet spots with the epicenter. Don't just stare at the trunk. Look up into those main leader branches. Um, there's a couple reasons. One, the bark's thinner up there, so it's easier for them to bore in. So some of them made the effort to climb up there or fly up there and enter and then reproduce up there. We also believe it's the heat that drives them up into the canopy. Uh, a little shadier, a little more protected, especially during the hot summer months. So you can see you still get that same kind of dripping, weeping effect, uh, but it's not a nice silver dollar, it kind of actually drips down the branch. So this is one thing I always kind of point out, and I, I had a great photo of it. Uh, it was um, showed how the beetle during the winter months tend to go over to the south side of the tree to attack because it was the warmer side of the tree. And then when it would attack during the summer months, it would go to the north side of the tree where it was shadier and cooler and attack. So it's definitely a very smart beetle. Um, and unfortunately, that, that's part of the reason why I don't think we're going to be eradicating it anytime soon. And we're probably going to have to eventually make this just a management process in our, in our urban canopy on this pest. Um, so that being said, the other ones that we have a lot of issues with are coast live oaks and olives. The reason why we have a problem with the olives more so than anything else is because of the fusarium. Uh, the fusarium is um, very detrimental to olive trees. So therefore, uh, whenever you're treating olives, even if you're kind of doing it preventative, you are much better adding in the fungicide as well. Whereas if I was doing a preventative on an oak tree, I would just do the insecticide. Uh, so like with the coast live oak. If I didn't have any attack sites, I'd just do the insecticide. However, once that uh, fusarium gets introduced, that's when we definitely want to add the fungicide into the, uh, the, into the uh, addition of the chemicals. So we also know that it attacks palms. And the reason why I want to kind of go over palms is because what we know about injecting palms is that when you put chemical into a palm, which is a monocot, we're putting it into the vascular bundle, and it's going straight up uh, to the meristem, the meristematic growth. So we don't have chemical going into older fronds. We don't have the chemical going into the pseudo bark. So keep that in mind when trying to treat for palms with um, uh, the invasive shot hole borer. Um, sprays, good topical sprays, once you've already established it, uh, definitely more effective uh, than systemic applications because the systemics just go straight into that vascular bundle and go straight to the top of the palm. Um, and so most of those beetles don't get the chemical until they've bored all the way into those vascular bundles. So that, that's kind of a little update on palms. So you guys have seen the research we've done over the years. I think we started looking at sites in 2011 and implementing in 2012, and this research was 2013 to 2014. And we started on the main ones that it was hitting, you know, sycamore, Japanese maple, sweet gum, this is at the Huntington. Um, and so you can see it's amazing what the treatment can do when you actually put in the insecticide and the fungicide. But what I kind of want to point out, and I kind of put these in order, I'm going to throw them quickly so you can kind of see the effect of it, is so this was uh, April 2013 to basically April 2014. You can see there's a peak in the population that we tend to see in the fall. We also tend to see an early peak in the April, so we see it going back up in April when it peaks, because that seems to be their two main flights. Um, but when you do these applications of chemical, you can now see 2013 to uh, 2014 to 2015, you can crash the population. And this is what we're trying to do at high infestation areas. So if you run into an HOA or you run into a city or a park or what have you where you have a number of trees being attacked, we can actually crash the population so it's no longer a lethal population in the area. And that's kind of the goal of when we do these treatments. Like I said, I, I think we've uh, signed the envelope on the whole eradication of this particular pest. We were just never aggressive enough early enough on uh, with this particular pest to achieve that. Um, and without the, the quarantines in place, we're, we're just going to move it throughout the state. Um, but the thing that we kind of saw was you have to go at it with the insecticide and the fungicide. And so in this case, this treatment was done with uh, triage and propozole. And so you can see it really does start to wear off 
after about two years. So if you're going to have a still a high pressure situation, you're going to have to come back in and retreat the trees. However, if you're in a situation where you've seen the pest population decline because you've crashed it, you're going to want to, you can possibly uh, delay the retreatment timing. But like I said, keep in mind, kind of like what we're seeing with the Whittier Narrows, is it seems like the population goes quiet, but is never completely gone, and then can resurge uh, later. So we're kind of watching that right now. Um, but kind of keep this in mind that you don't want to just rely on an insecticide. You don't want to necessarily rely on just on a fungicide. Uh, the combination application is much more effective. But our overall recommendation is if you just have uh, a preventative treatment, you know it's in the area and you just want to make sure you want to protect that high value tree, then by all means, just do the insecticide, just do the triage. If you have a light infestation where you got the pest and you have the disease, then you want to go for the dual application. Um, and then of course, same thing for moderately infested trees, but you got to go up to the high label rate on both the triage and propozole in order to do that. So keep that in mind. But there's nothing we can do, as you guys know, for highly infested trees. The vascular systems have been destroyed. There's no way the chemical's going to move. So unfortunately, those trees just sit there and act as, you know, basically vector trees. So if you can get those removed, that's probably the number one most important thing you can do. Uh, get them out while you can. Even though I know homeowners get very attached to their trees and so it's very hard to convince them. But you can kind of show them what we call light infestations. That's where we just have a few hits, basically no more than 10 attack sites on the entire tree. Tell them, you know, that's something you can work with. That's, that's not an issue. When we start to get into moderate, then, you know, we start seeing a lot more damage to the vascular tissue. Um, and essentially we say draw a square foot. If you see more than, you know, or count less than 10 attack sites in that square foot, then that's moderate. Uh, tree is still savable. When we run into high level attacks, that's when you really can't draw a square foot anywhere on here without getting at least 10 hit sites. Those are highly infested and they really need to come down. And here's the issue. Uh, these trees, especially like the acacia, might not die from these attacks. Um, it's a fairly vigorous tree. Uh, it tends to compartmentalize well, but the problem is it's a vector tree at this point. So if there are any susceptible trees such as sycamores nearby, uh, we are going to have that issue of, you know, vectoring the pests and disease over to the other trees that are more susceptible. Um, and of course, if it's an isolated attack, try and prune it out if you can, and then just treat the remaining tree with the insecticide and the fungicide. Um, but like I said, kind of a recap, not all trees die from invasive shot hole borer. We've kind of seen that time and time again. Not all sycamores will die from it. So we do see the most number of trees dying are sycamores pretty much followed by oaks, liquid ambers, and then willows. Willows are actually pretty high on the list. Uh, the biggest misnomer that I keep hearing is, you know, the invasive shot hole borer doesn't attack healthy trees, or it prefers healthy trees. And um, that's true, it does. It wants that good, healthy vascular tissue with water in order to grow its fungal uh, source of food. Uh, but unfortunately, we've seen this pest thrive more in conditions that stress trees. So though the tree itself might not be fully stressed, uh, stressful conditions does seem to be an indicator of population growth with this particular pest. Um, and then of course the recommendations come out that we shouldn't really be pruning the trees between April and October. Um, I know that's not feasible, especially on large scale, but you know, if you can do it judiciously and find which trees are more susceptible and trying to avoid pruning those during that time period, by all means, or if you know you're in a high infestation area, by all means, try and adhere to that. Um, but we, we have seen an increase of uh, populations when pruning is done during this time, of period, time period. And then of course, uh, we can do, need to do everything we can to basically bolster the tree's own immune system, its own ability to fight off uh, these particular pests and diseases. And that being said, micronutrients is one of the best things we can do for trees. Uh, we don't quite realize how effective and how much uh, basically good micronutrients do for trees. It's kind of like us taking our vitamins. Uh, we need our vitamins to survive. They need their micronutrients. And then, of course, the last thing that I put it on here, and I know some people are cringing, um, but we've been getting a lot of uh, talk out in the industry about per acre limits on the neonics. And the reason being is because the DPR is now starting to – take notice and make comments about um, uh, basically bids that are going out that have requests 
for app chemical applications beyond what the label uh, allows for. So keep that in mind if you're dealing with any sort of imidacloprid, spray, drench, uh, the neonic, um, you have to adhere to those per acre limits. So usually, like I said, about eight 12 inch trees per acre is what you're looking at. So those are some of the things that we've kind of seen recently. Um, I was hoping to get the new research in here, but sorry that didn't quite work out. Uh, but I just did want to say that with the labels, right now triage is one of the few labels that actually has uh, the Blue Shot Hole Bore on it. Keep in mind the triage G4 label is a general use label, it's a caution label. We tend to use this in a lot of cities. Um, you can still use the original triage, the restricted use triage, but you got to make sure you have the two double E label with it to have the invasive or the shot hole bore on there, as long as the pro as well as the propazole. But the new one that's out is the triage R10. This one is also restricted use, fair warning, but it's twice the concentration. Um, and the reason why we've seen people going to this one a lot more for these applications is because of this box down here under compatibility. So we're putting in half the amount of chemical, but we can also mix this chemical specifically with propazole. So you can mix them in the bottle, do one application at each injection site, one time and be done. So it really saves you on the labor side of this. Because as we all know, we've seen this cheat sheet uh, that I put together for treatment, and it just goes by diameter inch, and it talks about how much chemical you need, and this is with the original triage, and how much your plug costs are. So you can see your total cost. This doesn't even account for labor. So your labor savings is, is what's going to be huge. Your cost uh, between triage, triage G4, and uh, triage R10 is not significant. It's not going to really move the needle on your chemical cost uh, per tree, but it is going to save you huge on your labor costs. So keep that in mind since that's the most expensive part of doing any sort of trunk injection application is the labor involved with it. So this is something I just put together on pricing to kind of show the difference and what's going to be happening with the labor. So this was just a quick example of 78 sycamore trees, each being 16 inch in diameter, so planted roughly at the same time. Uh, they're going to remove and replace them, somewhere between $750 and $1,000. It's going to cost them about 60 grand to do that whole entire street. Um, city went and got a bid. Bid came back at $8.24 inch uh, per diameter inch for treatment. So each tree was going to cost roughly $131.84 to treat. And like I said, the treatment we're doing every possibly two years. So the annualized cost really per tree was $65.92. And it's going to cost about $5,000 for the whole street. So they can literally do that treatment for 11 years. But as we know, pests are cyclical. So odds are they might do the treatment once or twice. And if the pest does resurge like we saw in the Whittier Narrows, then yeah, they might be coming back again, you know, five or six years and doing a treatment again at that point. Um, but this really maintains the canopy of the tree the price is not cost prohibitive, but the interesting part is if you kind of look at this uh, on this previous sheet, they were actually, if you look at the size of the tree there, they're actually doing about $2 per labor cost per diameter inch. So on that 16 inch diameter tree, they're charging about $32 labor per tree. Um, and so they're going to cut their time literally in half. So you're practically doubling your profit margins uh, by just doing less chemical and be able to mix the chemicals. So keep that in mind when working on your pricing for, for treating for this particular pest. And just a couple things to review. Remember there's one really look-alike pest out there, the western oak bark beetle, that's vectoring the foamy bark canker disease. It looks just like the invasive shot hole borer. Uh, the only way you can really tell the difference, honestly, is if you actually take a sample and send it into the lab. And pretty much at this point, you have to send it up to the UC Davis lab for Keith Escalon to do the test because he's the one who's still really following this one. Um, but the nice part is, is the identification is pretty simple. If you cut down the tree, you're going to see that vascular uh, blackening right around there. It's going to be the real telltale of this particular uh, pest um, if you don't want to do the testing. And if you really don't want to do the testing, the treatment's the same. You're still using the triage, the propazole, and injecting it into the tree. So kind of keep that in mind. Uh, invasive pests, that I, since I have your attention, I want to get in front of you. You guys already know, hopefully, about the South American palm weevil and are very well aware of what it can do to our Canary Island date palms. Um, the reason why I bring this up is because um, I'm getting a lot of people saying that treatment is not being done. 
um, preventative treatment of soil drench with imidacloprid is very effective. We tend to go to trunk injected imidacloprid um, when the pest is already in the tree and we want to get it up there even faster to make sure we do not lose the meristem of the tree to this pest. So keep that in mind. If you happen to see this out in the landscape, definitely uh, report it. Let somebody know that you're seeing it because we are tracking this pest at this point in time. And so if you see the notches that have been eaten out of the fronds by the immatures, uh, then that, that's our key telltale. And be careful if you're shipping around uh, these particular palms to inspect them before they're shipped and to inspect them again when you receive them. So that way there's no question of this pest being in that canopy because nobody wants to plant out a $20,000 palm and find out it's already infested with this pest. Because uh, it does have the ability to kill these palms. And basically once it gets done feeding, it gets a high enough population, they actually eat out the meristem and the palm itself dies. So uh, like I said, the only thing I want to remind you also of is you only need one injection site for palm. Remember, just one injection site, it's a monocot. When you inject it in, it's going to go into a vascular bundle and it's going to head up to that main meristem. Uh, no need to do multiple injection sites. The other one I want to make sure everybody is looking for is the spotted lantern fly. Um, I wish I was in a classroom and I could ask you guys to raise your hands if you've heard of this one because this is a new one we kind of need everybody talking about. Uh, we started seeing ISA talk about it. Uh, we we're starting to see things pop up in um, our magazines about it, but really be able to identify this pest. Um, again, it's one of those particular ones that uh, uh, reproduces quickly and in large numbers. Uh, and can do a lot of damage to our, our hardwood trees. So right now we just found a live specimen in Davis, California. So we know it made it to California alive from Pennsylvania. Um, unfortunately, we, we don't know what our infestation level is, but we know we're under constant pressure of this entering our border. So the easiest identify, way to identify it is usually by the egg mass on the tree. Um, it's usually quite large because they have somewhere between 30 and uh, 150 eggs in there. Um, and then the actual pest itself is quite large. So it's noticeable, and especially if it happens to open up its wings because it's bright red. And sadly, this is a stage that tends to give me nightmares. Um, <laughs> it just doesn't quite look right. Um, but as you can see, it's, it's quite red in color. It's easy to see. But the interesting part about it is right now we don't really have any natural predators on it, and birds tend to avoid them. Even the birds know not to mess with these things. Uh, so there's nothing really currently checking the population other than um, insecticidal applications. So right now there's no chemicals in the state of California specifically listed for this pest. Um, we are working on this. Other companies are working on this. So that way once, uh, if this does establish in our area, uh, we can get treatment going to try and eradicate this one because it's definitely one of those we want to eradicate, because as you can see, when it attacks, it attacks in mass. And unfortunately, it's going to go after not only our urban trees, but it's going to go after our grape industry, our apple industry, probably our almonds. Um, so unfortunately, this is one of those pests that we, we want to see. If you guys see anything, please report it. Uh, send me a photo, talk to your county ag. Um, but this is definitely one of those pests that we want to pay attention to. And I just want to finish up by talking about some of the tree stressors that we can alleviate to help make it so they're less susceptible to these pests. And the number one thing I always talk about is water. I know, it's always water. The number one reason we have issues with our trees is usually water. And nine times out of ten, it's because we don't have enough water. Uh, but unfortunately, every now and again, it's because we water the trees way too much. So it's always kind of one or the other. So if we're in the drought issue, and I tend to always talk about this, it's the nutrient, it's got the humates and humectants that help hold water in the root zone. Uh, but the reason why I really advocate for this one, because it also has microbes, incredibly important, phosphorus, and then kelp for the cytokines to help with the root growth. So if you're going to be dealing with any sort of drought stress trees, construction trees, uh, transplant trees, this is really a great thing to add to help alleviate some of that water stress on your trees. And I can't sum it up any better than showing photos. So these were just on some, I think they were petunias or something of that nature, something that grew quickly so we could easily show this in a fast replicate. But you can see the, the immense root growth by just adding in this product. Um, this was a city who did it for us. You can see uh, the tree on the left did not get the product. The tree in the middle did. The tree on the right didn't. You can see the difference. 
And that all boils down to the fact that these were planted, watered in, and they waited 90 days and took these photos. These trees were able to hold on to their canopies because they were able to establish their roots because they had water available to them and because of the cytokinins in there uh, promoting root growth. So that being said, it's one of those things, it's an easy ad, it's not terribly expensive, but it can do wonders for the overall health of our trees. And then the other one I want to talk about that I'm not sure if you guys heard of, but this one's specifically called NAX, it's a salt flush. You guys know as well as I do, with the reclaimed water we deal with on a regular basis, um, the salts and, and micro metals and everything else that our, our trees are dealing with, um, it does not behoove them. Unfortunately, most of our trees stress when they're in these sort of conditions. So I'm always talking to people, do a soil test. It's not terribly expensive. Um, do a soil test, really see where you're at with your salt. If you are at really high salt levels, use a product like this and essentially weigh it, you design it designed as a drench. And what's happening is the only thing that binds tighter to the soil colloid than sodium is calcium. And calcium is a usable nutrient by plant material. So when you get the sodium uh, moved out of the soil conditions, uh, the trees have ability to take up the calcium and improve their overall health. And then we get that salt out of the soil. And then we start adjusting the things like the tree health and nutrition. Uh, but before then, we're just adding salt to salt. So if you can, take the time, do the soil test, get the salts out of the soil, and then go after treating the trees for, for nutrient issues. And honestly, the one, like I said, I treat the most for is micronutrients. That's always the goal. Our trees are yellow, they'll have intravenal chlorosis, and a lot of it has to do with not getting the micronutrients they need. And so we can inject the trees with micronutrients or we can do soil applications. Usually if you're injecting it, you get that great instant greening, but the long-term problem is the soil. We have to work on changing the soil. So keep that in mind. Injection is kind of a Band-Aid. It'll green it up, but it's not the answer to the, the whole solution. You got to work on the soil. So there's just a couple products that we have, MinJet, PalmJet. And when we actually inject them in, you can see the difference in the tree canopy. So this is one year later. This is another situation uh, where they was done, and this was just from basically a month apart for the micronutrients. And then this one was another one where it was just a little over a year later. You can see water had a lot of issue with this one as well. And then of course, this is kind of the timeline I'm talking about when, when we do this. Usually it'll keep it green up for two years, but you can see by that last photo, there's still a little bit of yellowing going on there. So odds are I would do another application of injection to get it fully greening before I went back and totally tried to rely on adjusting the soil for this. So that is my quick thing we can talk about to do to bolster our trees and trying to be more healthy against things like the uh, gold spotted oak borer and the prolificus or invasive shot hole borer now. Um, at this time, since we've got a couple minutes left, I'll take any questions you guys might have. If not, feel free. That's my contact information since we're all sheltering in place, I have lots of time to answer emails and phone calls and text messages in any way you would like to communicate with me. So, Zach, I'll turn it over to you if there's any questions you wanted to read off. Thanks, Don. Actually, uh, no questions were entered during your presentation, though I'm not surprised. You are fantastic at presenting our information. Um, hopefully, you guys get to catch Don live at some point. If you haven't already, she is quite a, an amazing presenter. She's very engaging uh, and, and know, always knows her stuff. Um, if anyone does have questions, feel free to, to type them in. Uh, and if anyone joined in late, uh, the group chat is also the place to put your ISA number for when we submit for ISA credits. Um, but Don, thanks again. Uh, so I'm going to stop the recording now just so we can work on that uh, and it looks like 